I want to introduce uh, Louis Marcos to you. Um, I picked him up at the airport today, about 4.30. And if you, he's from Houston. He's English professor at Houston Baptist University. And by the way, there are some brochures back there on the uh, music stand that you're, you're, please feel free to take. But if you've been following events in the news, you know that it has rained how, how many trillions of... A quarter of a trillion gallons. A quarter of a trillion gallons. Well, so I just looked for the wettest passenger getting off the plane. <laughs> and that was, that was him. Um, I became familiar um, with Dr. Marcos because uh, he is, uh, has done several lectures for the teaching company, if you're familiar with that. Um, recorded lectures from great professors, great teachers. And he had one called From Plato to Postmodernism, which I told him today I've listened to probably five or six times. So if you have any questions on it, I'll be glad to answer them. <laughs> um, in fact, if Dr. Marcos has any questions about it, I may be able to tell him a little bit. All right. Um, Dr. Marcos is the author of From Achilles to Christ, Why Christians Should Read the Pagan Classics. You'll be familiar with that title because that's the title of his lecture today. He's also the author of a number of other books, Apologetics for the 21st Century, Louis Agonistes, How C.S. Lewis Can Train Us to Wrestle with the Modern and Postmodern World, and in fact also did a, a series, lecture series for the teaching company on C.S. Lewis. On the Shoulders of Hobbits, now that's a popular topic around here. Um, the Road to Virtue with Tolkien and Lewis. Uh, also, C.S. Lewis, an apologist for education. Um, Restoring Beauty, the Good, the True, and the Beautiful in the Writings of C.S. Lewis. And The Eye of the Beholder, How to See the World Like a Romantic Poet, and the list goes on. Um, I saw... Dr. Marcos speak for the first time at the Society for Classical Learning. Where did we determine that was? Austin. Austin. And, um, and I was very impressed. Uh, I, I noticed the same thing I noticed in his recorded lectures, which was that he was enthusiastic. If there's no other adjective we could apply to him, enthusiastic would be the one. Um, uh, I think you'll see that tonight. Uh, he's a great presenter and a great person to hang out with. I think that the number of words per square minute that we talked this afternoon at the restaurant must have set some kind of record. <laughs> so, uh, will you please welcome Dr. Luis Marcos? Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Oh, this is this is working. Right? It is working. No, this one. Hello. It is good to be here. We were just at Mimi, some very good French food. It was very nice. Wow. I just came from Houston, as Martin told you. And as I was flying, I was reminded of a story I once read about a New York businessman who had to fly down to Houston for a business conference. Now, this man was a newlywed. He'd only been married six months, and this was the first time he was separated from his bride. He loved his wife dearly. And so the very second he got to his Houston hotel room, he whipped open his laptop computer and sent her an email. Unfortunately, in his haste, he typed in the wrong email address. And so rather than going to his wife in New York, it went to an 85-year-old woman in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Now, this woman had been married for 60 years, and just the night before, her husband had passed away in his sleep. And she was doing well. She had lots of support in her community. But that evening, people noticed that she seemed to disappear. They looked back and forth, they couldn't find her, they were nervous, and then someone thought, well, let's look in the study, because she was a woman who knew how to use her computer. They opened up the door to the study, and there they found the poor woman passed out in front of her computer. Nobody could understand why she seemed to be doing so well until someone thought to look at the computer screen. And this is what they read. To my dearest wife, I have arrived safely. I am awaiting your arrival next week. 
P.S. I suggest you wear shorts because it's awfully hot down here. <laughs> so watch out when you send those emails. Very, very dangerous. Now we're more wet than hot, but I've been living in Houston for 25 years, but you will quickly discover that I'm not from Houston because if I was from Houston, I would only be able to speak half the speed I'm speaking now. I actually grew up in New Jersey, don't hold that against me, uh, and ended up down south. Uh, when, I, when I moved there 25 years ago, I called it the Civil War. Now I call it the war between the states. Another few years, I'll call it the war of northern aggression. So they're making, they're making a good southern boy out of me. Well, I am here to answer a question, a question that should be burning in all of your minds, whether you're a parent or a teacher. And that is the simple question, why should Christians read the pagan classics, right? Now, when I say pagan in my speech, I don't mean some college frat boy, okay? I mean pagan as in the pre-Christian Greeks and Romans, people like Homer and Virgil, Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Ovid. These are the pre-Christian Greco-Roman writers. And when I say pagans here, I'm meaning the people that Dante called the virtuous pagans. The ones that were, you know, good people wrote these great works. They weren't believers because they lived before Christ. But they wrote things that had a profound influence on Christians in the Middle Ages and continue to have an influence. Well, the question is, that, and especially if you're evangelical kind of Baptist like I am, you have to ask, wait a minute, why am I wasting time reading pagan writers? How can I learn anything from someone that wasn't a believer, right? They, they didn't have the Old Testament, they didn't have the New Testament, they didn't know about Christ, they didn't know about the prophets. What can I learn from them? And so I, I hope that my speech will not only be informative, I hope it will be what you might call a visionary speech of why do we have schools like this one? Why do we have classical Christian schools? And I speak all the time, all over the place. I'm, just in the last month I was in Jackson, Tennessee, and I was in Fullerton, California, and I love these schools. In fact, I love them so much that whenever I can, I bring my daughter with me. She came with me to the Society of Classical Learning all over. And she likes it so much that she's a vocal performance major at HBU now, my school. And she wants to teach music at a classical Christian school. I don't know if I'll let her go so far away to Kentucky. But anyway, you can all put your dibs in and we'll see if you can get her. Um, but, and, and it's so exciting to see this movement all over the country. And I want to tell you, because I've spoken at so many of them, that no matter what, where I go, it is the same basic vision, the same enthusiasm, the same love that I see amongst the teachers, the same excitement I see amongst the parents and students of this education that is really educating us. But once again, this is an education that doesn't only read Christian writers. We spend a great deal of time. When I lecture in the Honors College, I spend almost a whole year only looking at pre-Christian writers. Why do we do that? What can a Christian learn from pagan writers? At HBU, we have our vision statement, and it's called the Ten Pillars, because we have these beautiful ten Grecian pillars on campus. And one of our pillars, it's my favorite one, is this. Our mission is to bring Athens and Jerusalem together. What does that mean? To bring Athens and Jerusalem together. All right. What is Western civilization? Western civilization is a creation of a serendipitous overlapping of two mighty streams. One mighty stream is the Greco-Roman stream coming out of Athens. The other one is the Judeo-Christian stream coming out of Jerusalem. They come together in the early church, particularly in St. Augustine, and they spread out to create the Middle Ages and to create Europe and eventually to create America. That is what we are. What we are becoming, I'm not sure, I'm frightened, but what we are is a mixture of those two classical streams coming together. And at a school like mine and at a school like this, we believe that in fact they should be brought together and they can be brought together in a creative way that far from taking us away from our faith can actually strengthen our faith and our witness in our country. We want to bring Athens and Jerusalem together. Now that phrase was made famous by a early church father named Tertullian. Tertullian asked the question, what hath Athens to do with Jerusalem? 
Now, unfortunately, when he asked that question, the answer implied was not very much. <laughs> I'm going to argue that they actually do have a great deal in common, that, that the Judeo-Christian writers like Homer, Virgil, Cicero, Augustine, I'm sorry, I mean, uh, Aristotle, Plato, they have a great deal to do with the Old and New Testament and the Christian tradition. Now, to work this out, we're going to work our way slowly through this. I want to start by laying down three foundational principles. And I'm going to start by asking you a question, but think a bit before you answer. If you are a Christian, where do you go to find truth in its purest, most perfect form? I want you to think about that. If you're a Christian, where do you go to find truth in its purest, most perfect form? form. Now, if you're a Baptist like me, you're immediately going to say, the Bible. And that's the wrong answer. Does anybody know what the right answer is? It is Christ, okay? It is the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In Christianity, truth is a person. Now, I do believe the Bible is the inspired and errant word of God, okay? But the center of truth in the Christian faith is Christ. He is truth in human form. The Bible is what points to Christ. It's, it may sound like people believe in the Bible and therefore they believe in Christ. But what really happens is we come to know and believe in Christ. And because we know him, we recognize the authority and truth of Scripture. Now, this is extremely important because if truth, the center of truth is a person rather than a book, then we're going to be able to find bits and pieces of that truth everywhere. I'm going to develop that idea. But you have to be very careful. Again, the Bible is fully reliable. It is, we need the Bible. But the Bible points to Christ, not the other way around. And it's becoming increasingly important for Christians, for us to understand this distinction, because there is a religion in the world that believes the only place where you find perfect truth is in a book. You know what the name of that religion is? It is Muslim. It is Islam. Okay? You need to understand, if you take comparative religion, well, sometimes they get it wrong. We think, kind of intuitively, that when you compare and contrast Islam with Christianity, you make an analogy, Jesus is to Muhammad as the Bible is to the Quran. But actually, that is not the proper way of lining them up. As weird as it sounds, Christ is like the Quran, and Muhammad is like the Bible. Now, let me explain why. For Muslims, they believe that the Quran is not the inspired word of God, right? They believe it is the dictated word of God. I don't know if you know this. Well, does anybody know what the word Quran means? It actually means recitation or dictation. They believe literally that Muhammad was a secretary. He took dictation and wrote it down word for word. In fact, the Muslims believe that Muhammad was illiterate. Isn't that weird? Basically, they believe, now I don't know if they would use this phrase, but this is my argument, that Muslims believe in the virgin birth of the Quran. So you want to think about that for a moment, right? He is illiterate, okay? This is the virgin birth of the Quran. And do you know who Muslims believe dictated the Quran to Muhammad? It wasn't God specifically. You know who it was? Nobody knows? It was an angel. Do you know? Say it. It was the archangel Gabriel. Now why is that significant? What did the archangel Gabriel do? Yeah, the Annunciation, right? The Annunciation, the one that came to Mary and said, you will have Christ, right? That was the Archangel Gabriel. By the way, I don't know if any of you noticed it, but, but Good Friday this year was a very, very special Good Friday. Because Good Friday this year was March 25th. Does everybody know what March 25th is? It is the Annunciation. If you're a Greek like me, it's also Greek Independence Day, but they chose it to be that because it was the Annunciation Day. That was back in the day when there were actual Christians in the country of Greece. Um, uh, by the way, does anybody know what else happens on March 25th? It's in a novel. Do you know? I'll give you a high five if you know. Very good. It's in The Lord of the Rings. March 25th is the day that Tolkien says that Mordor fell. Isn't that cool, right? Tolkien was a very strong Catholic. But anyway, I want you to understand, Good Friday was Annunciation. That only happened like three times this entire century. Um, so Jesus came into the world and left the world in the same day. The great poet John Donne wrote a poem about that because it happened back in the 17th century as well once. Uh, so why am I telling you this? For Muslims, I don't know if you know this, but Muslims do not accept translations of the Quran. 
It is only the Quran in the original classical Arabic. That's why you do know that there are more Muslims in Indonesia than all the Arabs put together. There are like five times more Asian Muslims than there are Arabic Muslims. And all those Asian Muslims still say all of their prayers in Arabic. They don't even know what they're saying. But they say that because they believe it's not Christianity. We believe that our Bible needs to be translated again and again and again. And watch out for people that say, especially Baptists, who say to you, well, it's only perfectly inerrant in the original Greek. Right? Okay. Let's remember something. Okay. The New Testament's written in Greek. What language did Jesus speak in? Aramaic, okay? So, now he knew a little Greek, right? So, in other words, already when you're reading the words in red, that's a translation, and that's okay. That shouldn't take, because we, we believe in a religion that's based on the incarnation, right? God came into the world. The Bible does need to be translated into every language, to be, in, to be taken. It's not, you know, and, and again, there were times when it's like, you could only read it in this language, but that's never been what Christianity is about. It is about spreading it out. So, the Bible points to Christ. We've got to be careful. Sometimes we treat the Bible as if God dictated it. He did not. Well, maybe some of the prophets when they say, thus saith the Lord. But most of the Bible is written from man's point of view. The Bible is like Jesus. It's 100% divine and it's also 100% human. It was fully inspired by God, but fully written by men. Right? It's important to understand this, that the center of our religion is the incarnate Christ, and truth flows out of him. Now again, the only absolutely reliable account is going to be the Bible, and that is our touchstone against which we measure things. Right? But at the center of our faith is the one who said, I am the truth. So keep that image in mind. The second important caveat is, even though we are fallen, even though we are depraved, even though we have a sinful nature, we still yearn for God. We are fallen and cannot come to Christ on our own, but we are still made in the image of God. We did not lose what they call the imago Dei in Latin. We didn't lose the image of God. We still yearn for God. And yes, the pre-Christian pagan writers yearn for God as well, and some of that yearning finds its way into their great literature and philosophy. The best way to explain this point is by quoting that famous line from the very beginning of Augustine's Confessions. Many of you will recognize this. O oh Lord, Augustine says, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless remember, until they rest in thee. Right? Our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. We have that God-shaped vacuum, right? That, that, you know, that, that, that can't be filled by anything else. So we do yearn. That doesn't mean we can save ourselves, but we do yearn for God. We immediately go astray, okay? But the yearning is there in all of us. As, as uh, I was reading a book by uh, Alvin Plantinga, and his main point was a point that was he found it both in the Summa of Aquinas and in the Institutes of Calvin. And he says in his wonderful way that if you can find something that Calvin and Aquinas agree on, it's probably important. And they both agreed on this, that we have an inbuilt sensus divinitatis, a sense of the divine. It is there, and, 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 and it, it, it's, it, you know, it's, and, and this is important for Alvin Plantica, because people say, no, no, it's impossible to understand supernatural things. Well, we have, we, we have five senses, but we have a sixth sense, a sense of the divine that is a real sense that can apprehend non-physical things, supernatural, metaphysical things. We have this, all of us have it, even in our unregenerate state. Again, we can't save ourselves, but even in our unregenerate state, we have a sense of the divine that yearns and reaches out. Okay? That's the second one. The third one is this. The Bible is not a textbook. The Bible does tell us everything we know to find salvation in Christ, to live the Christian life, but it does not tell us everything there is to know. The Bible has a lot to say about science, but it's not a science textbook. Here's another thing. This is going to shock you. Get ready for this. The Bible is not a dating manual. <laughs> this, I want that to be very clear here, okay? 
I know so many homeschool boys that every year burn the book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye in Effigies, burn that book. Actually, you know, that guy, uh, later on, he wrote another book. Basically, I was wrong. I think, you know, but anyway, he, he found some good. But anyway, look, there's principles in the Bible, okay? But the Bible does, you know, we, we, we have this idea now, this is a very modern American notion that the answer to every single possible question we have is in the Bible. No, the Bible never makes that claim. It doesn't have that, it doesn't attempt to do that. You know what else the Bible isn't? It's not a diet book. Yes, okay? These weird people that want to find secrets to dieting in the Bible. Right? What is that called? Ezekiel bread? What's that all about? Come on. Look, Jesus did not fast for 40 days and nights because he was on a diet. Okay? But again, we have this really weird, especially Americans. I don't even know. It's not really even in Europe. It's a very American thing that every, no. There, we should read other books. Now, look, do we have to read any other book than the Bible? No. But do we have to go to college? No. Right? Do we really have to have a big house? No. Do we have to? I mean, there's lots of things we don't need. Okay? We can just get by in a fifth grade education, work hard, eat, sleep. But, but no, I mean, life is more than that. And especially if God has privileged us with the ability to go to college, let's study and read other books. Now again, we've got the Bible as our, I keep the word touchstone. What is the touchstone? Um, it's a character in Shakespeare. What, what Shakespeare play is a character named Touchstone? Oh, wait, we finally, do you know? Do you know? As you like it, very good. Touchstone is the clown and as you like it. It's also a movie studio owned by Disney. Um, but what a touchstone is, it's a beautiful word. I want you to make, there's a wonderful magazine called Touchstone. Um, touchstone is a sort of shiny black basalt kind of stone, shiny kind of stone that you can use, and if you've got a piece of gold, and you're not sure whether it's real gold or fool's gold, you can rub it against the touchstone, and by the mark it leaves, you can determine whether it's real gold or false gold. Do you understand what a touch, it's a sort of yardstick. Uh, the, the touchstone of morality would be like the Ten Commandments, right? It's a touchstone or a measure against which we can measure things. Thank God that the Lord gave us the Bible as a measuring so we can measure things against them. But we need to read other things, right? Again, we can survive without it. But God wants us, you know, okay, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with intelligent design. There's a wonderful book that came out a few years ago now called The Privileged Planet. And a lot of you probably know already that they have this thing called the fine-tuning of the universe. It's like everything in the universe is perfectly, miraculously fine-tuned to allow human life to exist on Earth. But what a lot of people didn't know until this book, The Privileged Planet, came out, is that not only um, are we in like, like the only spot in the universe where life is possible, but our solar system and the placement of our planet is such that we can actually explore and investigate the universe around us. If our atmosphere was a little bit different, if, we, if everything wasn't where it's supposed to be, we would not be able to search the stars around us. And what, what that implies, to me at least, is that God wants us to search. If he allowed, and you know, God speaks to us through the majesty and glory of nature anyway. I'll talk about that a little bit later. So again, the Bible, the center of truth is a person, not just a book. All of us have an inbuilt sensus divinitatis yearning for God, and the Bible is not the only book we should read. The Bible never purports to tell us everything there is to know. Let's read other books. Okay, now let me start moving towards my thesis, if you will. A great book came out about 50, 60 years ago called Christ and Culture. Did you ever read that, like in seminary or something? It's a good book. They, they, they reissued it a few years ago for the 50th anniversary. It's by a guy named H. Richard Niebuhr. He is the brother of Reinhold Niebuhr, and he's actually more orthodox than his brother. I much prefer H. Richard Niebuhr. Um, and in, he offers a series of different paradigms for how to relate Christ to the surrounding culture. And he gives us five. I'm going to focus on three. The two extremes are called Christ against culture and the Christ of culture. Christ against culture basically says Christians have to remove themselves from the secular world around them. Now, that ethic, right, separates yourself from the unbelievers. That was more or less the reigning ethos for who? 
the Jews, right? I mean, much of the Old Testament is about be ye separate from the unbelievers. Not totally, okay? Uh, we we're always forget this. Whenever you hear, you know, modern, like, new atheists say, the Jehovah, Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament is a, uh, a tribal deity, right? Look, if you just read very carefully Genesis 12 when he calls, when he calls Abraham, God says, Abraham, I will bless you so that, here we go, so that you can be a blessing to all the nations, okay? Right from the very beginning, okay? I don't know if you know this, but there are a lot of modern Jews these days that are embarrassed by the whole concept of being a chosen people. They, like, reject the concept of being a chosen people. Very strange. I guess they think it's elitist, okay? Obviously, they never listen to that great prophet and sage, Tevya, who says, Oh, God, I know it's good to be the chosen people, but couldn't you choose someone else once in a while? It's not always good to be chosen, okay? But... Right from the beginning, God chose the Jews so that they could bless the rest of the world. And they didn't do it, and the early Christians didn't do it either, right? They wanted to keep it in Jerusalem and not spread it out to the rest of the world and stuff like that. Okay? But, but still, generally speaking, you know, God gave the, the Jews the kosher laws, laws. One of the reasons he gave them the kosher laws, if you're a Jew and you follow the kosher laws exactly, you basically can't visit a Gentile. You, just, you can't even go into the house of a Gentile. So, I mean, God did want them to be separate from the real corrupting influence of the Canaanites and Phil Philistines and Phoenicians and all the other ones. But that is really not the New Testament ethic, right? Now, can you think of a famous group of Christians who take very seriously, separate yourself from the unbeliever? You know what they're called? It starts with an A. The Amish. Okay, there are other groups. So that's the best known. Uh, uh, until Harrison Ford found them. But anyway, um, great movie if you haven't seen Witness. Very good movie. Uh, in fact, in, in the movie Witness, the Amish guy quotes that from the Bible. Be ye separate from the unbelievers. Uh, and, but, but again, I mean, in John chapter 17, that's what we call the high priestly prayer, where Jesus prays for the disciples and through them for us. That's where Jesus basically says, I want you to be in the world, but not of it. So we're not of the world, but we are called to be what and what in the world? Salt and light. Okay, we need to be in the world. So there are some Christians that follow the Christ against culture, right? So often small pockets will do that, separate, form their own Christian subculture, all that sort of thing. But that really is not the New Testament ethos. The other extreme from Christ against culture is called the Christ of culture. That's more theological liberalism. Whatever the, the modern, whatever the secular world is doing, we just take it in and we slightly Christianize it. As Bishop Spong, uh, which really should be an oxymoron, Bishop Spong, because that guy doesn't believe anything. Uh, but I, I don't understand. If you're a bishop and you just stop believing in every Christian doctrine, shouldn't you lose your job? I just don't understand. Is there not a job description called the Nicene Creed? I don't know. If one of you teachers just said, I actually don't believe in education. I don't believe children are capable of learning anything. Shouldn't you lose your job? Anyway, uh, Bishop Spahn wrote a book called Christianity Must Change or Die. Okay? That's Christ of culture. We just, whatever is happening, we just take it in and we adopt it. And uh, basically, uh, something that Martin Luther King says in the letter from the Birmingham jail, the church used to be a thermostat. Now it's a thermometer. What's the difference? A thermostat means it's uh, 60 degrees in the room and you want it to be 70. So make the thermostat 70 and it forces the temperature to come up. Right? A thermometer just tells you what the temperature is. The church more and more has become a thermometer. Whatever the outside world is doing, we just follow it and you know, give it a Christian lingo and that's it. So those are the extremes. In between, there are, there are several different paradigms. But the one I want to focus on excuse me, is what he calls Christ over culture. And interestingly, this is the paradigm that he associates with the Catholic Church, right? But really, it's about time that Protestants, evangelicals like myself, learn from this. Because a lot of, <laughs> there we go, a lot of classical Christian schools are learning from this paradigm. And what it says is that if you take the culture and move upward to find the purest part of that, the Cicero, the Virgil, the Aristotle, the Plato, and what we need to do as Christians is to take that up into Christianity. Not, not lower Christianity down to that, but take that up. Finish the journey. Complete the journey. That there are truths there that we can take and take up into Christianity. Do you know what the uh, old medieval writers called that? They called it blank the Egyptians. Does anybody know the phrase? And if you know the phrase, it's called despoiling the Egyptians. Now, you, you know when that happened? Did he say it? Did he say it? I know he's talking about 
Oh, just, oh, good. Okay. When, when did they despoil the Egyptians? Do you remember? When, when they're about to leave on the Exodus, what did God tell them to do? Go to all your Egyptian neighbors and ask them for stuff. Okay? And they'll give it to you. Right? Uh, and so... They, they, they took all the, of course, some of that gold was later turned into the golden calf. We won't go there. Um, but that, you, you have to despoil the Egyptians that way. Uh, there are a few famous Old Testament people that were taught fully in the pagan ways, but then God used that to make them great leaders. Can you think of people? There's, I guess there's really three of them that you could say that of. Okay, Joseph, good. He was educated in all the ways of the... Egyptians, right? I guess I'm getting too close to that. There must be feedback. Um, I got to stay here in my cage. My cage, right? The, um, so, uh, so Joseph, later on Moses, grew up, and, and, and we're told that particularly in Stephen's sermon in, in the book of Acts. Right? He was, and, and then, of course, who else learned all the mystical ways of the people he grew up with? You said Daniel, okay? So, and by the way, there's another one, uh, Origen, kind of an interesting person. I, I read this in Lubeck. Are you a Lubeck fan too, Mark? Are you a Henry de Lubeck fan? Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I was reading, and he was pointing out um, that Origen used this example. And this is very obscure. If, if you know this, I'll be really impressed. Uh, it, it, there's a place in the Old Testament that says, if you're a Jewish man and you've, 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 you've conquered a people, and you fall in love with one of the you know, Canaanite women or something, and she wants to become Jewish and stay with you, do you know what they would do? And if you remember, it's very obscure. They would shave her head. Right? And then cut her fingernails and stuff, and then it would grow back later. But the idea was you're, you're purifying her and then taking her in to the fold. So there's some example. Now, you, you know that mostly God said, don't intermarry with them. But notice he's offering an example where if they are like a Ruth or something like that, truly willing to join, but it's an interesting, you have to purify and bring her in that way. Right? So th that would be the model of Christ over culture, that we take the best that is there and take it up into the fuller truth of Christianity. Now, what stops us, and particularly I'm saying as Protestants, what stops Protestants from accepting this idea of Christ over culture? I think it comes partly from a misunderstanding or an extremism of total depravity. When a lot of people say total depravity, that's the T of tulip. Uh, by the way, I don't know if we have any Calvinists here. Martin, you'll appreciate this. For, former Calvinist back there. The uh, confused man. Anyway, the, um, the uh, I don't know, you know, the Calvinists have their tulip. Well, I don't know if you know, but the Calvinists got together last summer, and they are, they've decided that they are going to replace the Calvinist tulip with the Calvinist daisy. I want you to think Getting rid of the Calvinist tulip and replacing with the Calvinist daisy. Do you know why? He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. So if you're a Calvinist, you'll get that joke. If not, it's just not funny. Okay. Anyway, so total depravity, a lot of people use that word to mean utter depravity, right? And again, I, I know a lot of people, they speak of it as if we're so depraved that we've lost the image of God. And that's just not biblical. We are still in the image of God. It has not been effaced. We are not totally depraved in the sense of being completely and utterly wretched. But we are totally depraved in this sense, that every part of our person has been subjected to the fall. So whatever, our soul is fallen, our body's fallen, our flesh, our imagination, our reason, every part of us has been subjected to the fall. That's why we need authority, that's why we need revelation, all of this sort of stuff. That's what a lot of people push it so far I mean, I don't know if you know that. I can give you a whole speech on this, but I, 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 I often uh, give a challenge to my American literature fellow professors, and I say that in between Jonathan Edwards and Flannery O'Connor, I cannot find a single major American author who could say that they believed in the Trinity, the Incarnation, the Atonement, and the Resurrection. I don't think there's a single one. It's unbelievable. I don't know why. There's, many, there's a lot more Christians in British and French literature, believe it or not, until the very, very recently, after Flannery O'Connor start getting some believers. Very, very strange. Nathaniel Hawthorne, okay? He didn't understand grace, but he did understand original sin. You notice that? I, he had this like, really, really dark view of original sin, okay? But he didn't understand grace. It doesn't do you much good, okay? It's like the very opposite of Houston's very own, uh, uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, um, I forgot Lakewood Church. Have you, heard, have you heard of our Lakewood Church? Yeah. They, they, they understand grace, but they're not too big at depravity. But anyway, it's still kind of cool. Joel Osteen, that's his name. It's like, it's like five miles from my house. Anyway, 
they meet, I'm not joking, they meet at the place that used to be the basketball court. And that's where they used to have the circus. <laughs> I took my kids to the circus. Anyway, so. But, okay, we need to understand that, yes, we are depraved, okay, but we still yearn for God. The image of God has not been effaced. And we have, a, again, another one, Mark Twain. You ever read Mark Twain? On it. He wasn't a believer at all. He was an atheist. But on and on and on in the American, on, you're, you're wretched, you're wretched, you're wretched, you're wretched. Well, well yeah, we're wretched because we're fallen. But we are still creatures made in the image of God, right? Who have a yearning and a desire for God. And that yearning finds its way into the great poetry and philosophy and stories, myths and whatnot of the pagan peoples, right? Uh, and again, even like Luther is great, but if you've ever read The Bondage of the Will, sometimes Luther gets so angry at Erasmus, he'll say things like, Apart from grace, there is only wrath. Apart from light, only darkness. Apart from the way, only error. Well, well yeah, obviously without grace, we're lost. But we, we sometimes get into this thinking that is so dichotomous. It's like we drop a wall down and everything over here is darkness and everything over here is light. And that's just not, I mean, just give you one example. Okay, Melchizedek was not a Jew. Okay, and Melchizedek's name for God, El Elyon, which means God Most High, was not a Jewish name for God. But Abraham accepts that name for God when he makes his covenant with Melchizedek. Okay, so there, there are examples of this in the Old and New Testament. We'll give you more examples as we go along. But we need to be careful. We need to be careful of a kind of dualism that completely separates soul from flesh, right? Uh, Christianity from culture. God Again, let's stop dropping a wall. Let's make it more like a staircase. Christ over culture leading upward. Okay, now I'm ready to give you my formulation. I guess it's in a sense it's sort of my version of Christ over culture. I'll put it this way. Christianity is not the only truth. Never thought you were about to say that. Okay. Christianity is not... That's almost like saying, give me the next drink. I mean, we don't normally say these things, but... Christianity... <laughs> Christianity is not the only truth, but it is the only complete truth. We say that again. Christianity is not the only truth. It's the only complete truth. What is the difference? Okay, Big, important word, that word complete. If you say Christianity is the only truth, you're dropping that wall down. As if everything that is not Christian is absolutely evil and dark and bad and deceitful. That's not the way it is. You can find bits and pieces of truth in every culture, every religion, every people group across the world. You will find bits and pieces of truth everywhere, okay? But only in Christianity, only in Christ himself, do you find truth in its absolute, complete, and perfect form. So everything points upward to Christ. I grew up in the 70s, and, and the, 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 the liberal, liberal theologians would always say, well, truth is at the top of the hill, and there's many ways around it. I accept that image. The truth is at the top of the hill, but the truth that's at the top of the hill is the guy who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay? Imagine the picture of that famous mountain in Rio de Janeiro with the giant statue of Jesus. That's the one that the bird in Rio it ran into. You see that? <laughs> Kid reference over there. Anyway, you remember that, right? Have any of you been there? Rio Day? I've not been there, but you've all seen it in movies, right? So think of that giant statue of Jesus with his arms out like that. That's the truth that's at the top of the hill, and there are many ways around. I love listening to testimony. I love listening to testimonies from people that have really heavy accents, you know, from like, you know, Greece or from China or from Louisiana. Uh, but I, I just love to, to hear... <laughs> accents from people because it reminds me that Jesus is the God of the nations, the God of the universe, right? And I love listening to these so amazing stories, these testimonies. We should go back and do that. We should have testimony nights in our church, right? Because it's fascinating the way God reaches us in so many different ways. God, you know, sometimes he's got a sense of humor, a strange way people come to him, right? So the point is, if we keep pushing our way up that hill, Christ is the truth at the top of the hill. Let me give you an image of this. My favorite part of the Christmas story are the, is the journey of the Magi. Now, who are the Magi? 
They're obviously not Christians. They're no Christians yet. But they're not Jews either. They don't have access to the Old Testament. They don't know the prophets. They're probably, a lot of people think today, they're Zoroastrians coming from Persia. There are Magi that are mentioned in the book of Daniel. Right? Uh, but they are, they, they are they're pagans. They're virtuous pagans. All they had is their limited wisdom. The stars. They studied the stars. They looked for signs in the stars. And they followed the star. And it led them to the Christ child. Now think about this. When the Magi got to the Christ child, this is what they could have said. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. We walked a thousand miles. Oh, man, the kid just dirtied his diaper. I'm going home, and that's the last time I remember following a stupid star. You understand that? And people do that today. They get really close, and they find out Christ is the only way. Ah, I don't like that. I mean, I mean, that's what they, but that's not what they said. What the Magi said was, yes, this is what we have been seeking all of our life. I never could have guessed it, but now that I'm here, I recognize that this is the truth. I have always yearned for. Do you understand? Does that make sense? Okay? It is the journey of the Magi going up and up and up and finding at the end the climax, the consummation, the fulfillment of everything they've looked for and sought after. Right? Again, they could have rejected it, but they didn't. They accepted it. Right? Look, at the core of what I'm saying is a central concept in theology. You will read it in Catholicism, you will read it in, in, you will read it in Calvinism, you'll read it in, 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 all Christians should understand this because it's very biblical, it's very clear. Uh, I was telling Martin, if, if you're a Calvinist, you know what the Calvinist Bible is? It's the Epistle to Romans with a few other books, okay? And Romans 1 lays out, a, and it's also, by the way, in the Institutes of, of the Christian Religion, begin with the distinction between general revelation and special revelation. What is the difference between the two? General revelation is the way that God speaks to all people through nature, through the majesty of nature, through our conscience, and C.S. Lewis would add, through the good dreams of the pagans. God speaks to all of us. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. General revelation. All people have access to that, right? But there's another thing called special revelation. And that is what he said to the Jews and then to all people through Christ. It is the Old Testament, the New Testament, the prophets, supremely Christ himself. That is special revelation. Again, we cannot be saved by general revelation, but general revelation points us to special revelation. And if we will continue that Christmas journey, it will take us to the special revelation. Okay, C.S. Lewis's favorite psalm. Oh, I'd be really impressed. Does anybody know what C.S. Lewis's favorite psalm was? I would be really impressed. If it, he mentions it in the book he wrote called Reflections on the Psalm. It's Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of the Lord. The skies are proclaiming his handiwork. That is a central statement of general revelation. Why does God say in Romans 1 that we are without excuse? Remember why? Because God's majesty and glory has been displayed in nature. And we are without excuse. It's right there. Okay, now, and I keep getting that feedback. Um, it's weird. Uh, oh, God's not saying I'm, I'm wrong or something here. It's strange. Okay. Anyway, but the, uh, okay, now, I, I want to tell you something about that psalm that's really, really neat. It's, it's a fairly short psalm, but if you go read it, it begins, the heavens are telling the glory, blah, 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 and then the second half of it starts talking about the law, the Torah, and celebrates the Torah and how we learn from it, meditate on it. Okay, if you look carefully at that Hebrew psalm, the first half of Psalm 19, when it's talking about the heavens, it uses the word Elohim. That's sort of the generic word for God, like our word God. It's just the generic word for God. But in the second half, when it moves from the heavens to start talking about the law, guess what word or name it uses for God? It uses Yahweh. I am that I am. You see? So through the heavens, God speaks to us generically. The law, he speaks to us on a first name basis. Right? Understand? If you're, old, if you're old as me, you might remember a movie called Oh God with George Burns where he sends John Denver and he says, nobody's going to believe me. And he says, here, you can show my card. And he gives him a business card that just says God on it. G-O-D. There, that'll convince everybody. But anyway. I am that I am, okay? Look, 
especially all Christians, evangelicals, we're always talking about what does God do for you know, the guy in the middle of Africa that never hears, right? And we look for you know, an answer in the Bible, and we turn to Romans, and what does Romans say? How can, they, how can they believe without hearing, right? And he says, they have heard, for their voice has gone out to all the world. Do you recognize that, Romans 10 or 9? 9 or 10, somewhere around there. Right? I wonder if any of you ever looked up the Old Testament reference that he's quoting. The voice has gone out to all the world. Because you know where it comes from? The heavens are telling the glory of the Lord. The skies are proclaiming his handiwork. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they are not silent. Their voice has gone out to all the world. It's a reference to general revelation. Right? Most Christians, a lot of us will just believe that, you know, if you're really searching, God will find a way to get the truth to a Bible or whatever, God will find. Lewis suggested maybe on the moment of our death, because the moment of our death is an eternal moment. Maybe at the moment of our death, Christ appears. We don't know that, and we will not know that until we get to heaven, right? Uh, but, but whatever, this is a biblical distinction. From the great virtuous pagan writers, we get general revelation at its best. One of the things I spoke, this might have been when I spoke on Martin, when, when I met you. Uh, I wrote a book called On the Shoulders of Hobbits, or The Road to Virtue, and I talk a lot about the seven virtues. And I'm sure in this school, we talk about the seven virtues, and you know we, what we call them? The four classical virtues, or the four cardinal virtues, as opposed to the three classic, I'm sorry, as opposed to the three theological or Christian virtues. We have any students that can tell me the four classical virtues? These look like smart students. Can you name them? You can probably say them in Latin, but you can say them in English. <laughs> Come on, what are they? What's that? Prudence, good. Prudence or wisdom? Temperance? Uh, courage. Courage? Um, and... Those the J. Justice. Justice, okay, he knows it. Justicia. Courage, by the way, in Latin would be fortitude, right? So it was commonly understood, that's part of what my book is about, it's commonly understood that the four classical virtues were virtues that the higher pagans could arrive at through general revelation. And it was often believed that people like Plato and Virgil embodied the four classical virtues. But it took the fuller, special revelation of the Bible to give us the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. Okay? So that, that is another way of understanding four to three. And you know, in, in the Middle Ages, four is always the number of man. It's the number of the earth, you know, the four corners of the earth and the four men. But three is, is the number of God, of the Trinity. And notice that four and three are both important numbers in the Bible. And notice that four plus three equals seven, another important number. And four times three equals 12, which is another important number. So at the core are those numbers. Built into that numerology is an understanding of the movement. In, in, in Dante's Divine Comedy, do you know what character represents the four classical virtues? Virgil, very good. Who represents the three theological virtues? No, not Dante, but Beatrice. Beatrice. I'll give you a high five. Okay. <laughs> Beatrice, the lovely Beatrice. Okay, would you like me to introduce you to this pretty lady over here? Yes. <laughs> This is my job because I'm afraid there's not going to be another generation, at least not another legitimate one. But anyway, I need to, we need to match these kids up, okay? This is our job. Maybe not in high school. Send them, send them to me. College will match. Anyway, I think we're going to start making that as a promise in the honors college. I don't know. I'm still leery about that, but we promise, you know, so we'll, we'll, we'll do our best. Okay, so uh, again, th there is this movement from one to the other, right? Now, Again, we're looking for a little more Bible references here, aren't we? Okay. If you believe in classical Christian education, if you believe that, again, in Christ over culture, then probably the most important passage in Scripture is Acts chapter 17. You'll probably recognize this. This is during Paul's second missionary journey when he is traveling through Greece. And in the second half of chapter 17, he visits Athens. He goes into the Agora, the marketplace, the forum, and there he notices idols galore. They had idols to every single god. They even had a temple to an unknown god. Now at first Paul's heart was really hurt by the idolatry he saw. But then he saw that temple to the unknown god. And then he thought, now I understand Marcus' lecture. I know what to do. That's what he said. <laughs> and so he went up to the Areopagus. 
to meet with the Epic and, uh, Epicurean and Stoic philosophers who would talk to people to decide whether to allow these new ideas into their city, right? And Paul comes before them, and Paul says, men of Athens, which is the way that Socrates Again, his uh, speeches. By the way, at first they didn't like Paul, and they said, "You're you're bringing, you're advocating foreign gods." By the way, that was one of the three charges laid against Socrates. If you know the apology, right? They they said Paul is advocating foreign gods. Speak. He begins. Men of Athens. How, how Socrates began. Men of Athens. I can see that in all ways you are a very religious people. For I notice that you even have a temple. Notice he doesn't say idol. He is speaking their language. He's making a cultural bridge. I notice you even have a temple to an unknown God. And then Paul speaks the words that I believe the entire ancient world was waiting to hear. And since all four of my grandparents were born in Greece, I feel this, this very personally, okay? I feel this is what Greece and Rome we're longing to hear. And Paul says it this way. Now, therefore, what you have worshipped in ignorance, I will proclaim to you as known. And then he goes on to tell him that, you know, the God who created the world does not live in temples built by human hands, right? For he made all people, right? Out of one man, he created all races of men. He set their times and places so that they might reach after and yearn after him, though he is not far from any of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As your own poets, your own pagan poets have said, we are his offspring. Now, a lot of people don't realize that Paul is actually quoting two different pagan poets. One pagan poet named Epimenides from the island of Crete, he said, in him we live and move and have our being. And there was another one named Aratus, and there was another guy named Cleanthes who said, uh, we are his offspring. And, and when, they, when they say his, they mean Zeus. They're talking about Zeus or Jupiter, right? But Paul realizes that there is some truth in these pagan poems that he's treating as if they were prophecies. The complete truth is not there, but they got an inkling of this. Let me finish the story. Let me take it upwards so you can be there. Right? I don't know if you know this. Okay, I'll bet everybody in this room knows that C.S. Lewis was an atheist for many years before he became a Christian. That's pretty well known. What is less known is that Lewis did not go directly from being an atheist to a Christian, like Lee Strobel or Josh McDowell. Lee Strobel is a colleague of mine now at HBU, which is pretty cool. Um, a wonderful Chicago accent. Anyway, um, C.S. Lewis, at the age of 30 or 31, became a theist, a believer in God, but it took him another year and a half about to become an actual believer. What was holding him back from becoming a believer in Christ? Well, he wrote an autobiography, a spiritual autobiography called Surprised by Joy, and he gives us a little insight into this. One of the things that was holding him back, see, a lot of you, probably like me, take Lewis as your role model. But I'm luckier than a lot of you because he gets to be a double role model for me because he was an English professor like I am. So he's like a role model for me in lots of other different ways as well. And it's really kind of cool. And I've modeled myself on his books like Preface to Paradise Lost. Um, but anyway, um, what was holding Lewis back is, like me, Lewis had a love of mythology, a love of legends. And he was a big fan of a book called The Golden Bough by Sir James Fraser. Now, you may not have heard of Sir James Fraser, but how many of you have recognized the name Joseph Campbell? Does this sound familiar? Okay, he was the one who had a very profound influence on uh, George Lucas and the Star Wars trilogy. With all of, he, he was the one who talked about archetypes, that as you look across different cultures, you find repeated images and types and archetypes and stuff like that. Well, in The Golden Bough, written in the late Victorian age, what this guy did, Sir James Fraser, it's a fascinating book to read. It's one of those books that's this long, but you can get a one-volume version that's more than, more than you need uh, in one volume. And what he noticed was that across all the different ancient cultural groups, wherever you went, they all had a similar, similar story about a god who comes to earth, usually as some kind of demigod, dies, and returns to heaven. And it's all linked in with taboo sins. It's all linked in with the cycles of nature and all that sort of stuff. Now, he gave a name to this type or archetype. He called him the Corn King. 
Now, does anybody know what a British person means when he says corn? You know, he means wheat, okay? When British people say corn, they mean wheat. Even today, they mean wheat. If they want to say corn, they say maize, okay? That'll confuse you, right? Because you do know that corn is from the New World. Right? Before Columbus, there was no corn. There was only wheat, rice, and stuff like that. Uh, and you know what else? There was no tomatoes, there were no potatoes, there was no chocolate, there was no coffee, and there was no tobacco, right? That all came from us. Uh, and I think most of it came from Kentucky, at least the tobacco. But anyway, <laughs> the, um, the <laughs> smoke of that bluegrass. Anyway, the, um, but uh, I just lost my point. Oh, yeah. The corn king, okay, is tied to the cycle of the grain or the wheat. Now, let me give you some names of the corn king you might re recognize. If you are a Greek, your corn king is called Adonis or Bacchus. If you are Egyptian, you have a story about a god named Osiris. If you are Babylonian, you call him Tammuz. If you are Persian, you call him Mithras. If you are a Norseman, you call him Balder. Essentially, if you're Hindu, you call him Rama or Krishna. Wherever you go, there is this story of this God sort of coming down and dying a violent death. Now, none of them have an actual resurrection, but he goes back somehow. And almost all of them have seasonal rituals every year. In fact, Adonis was the lover of Venus. And when Adonis died, they celebrate once a year passion or his death and then his rebirth and it throughout Greece in the ancient world they had a famous statue of Venus holding the beautiful dead Adonis in her arms and weeping and do you know what that image becomes in Christianity it becomes a Pieta and it's based on that and and that's not like the Catholics are trying to hide that they understand what I'm talking about right here that Christ is the fulfillment of these things okay now Think about it. If you're a secular person and you read the story of Jesus, God coming to earth, dying and returning, oh, obviously, Jesus is the corn god of the Hebrews. Right? You see how it works? And that's what Lewis believed. Christ of culture, if you want to call it that, right? And then one day, when he was 32 years old, he was taking a walk around Maudlin College, Oxford, around a place called Addison's Walk. Anybody been there? Addison's Walk? Oh, some have been there, okay. Walking around with his very good friend, J.R.R. Tolkien, very strong Catholic, and author of Lord of the Rings. And while they were walking around, Tolkien said to his friend, you know, did you ever think maybe the reason that Jesus sounds like a myth is because he's the myth that became fact? In other words... We're all created in God's image. We all yearn. And out of our yearning, we understand the need for this, right? Doesn't it make sense that when God actually affects our salvation, he'll do it in a way that answers our deepest yearnings? What am I saying? If you are a Christian, you believe that Jesus Christ fulfilled the Old Testament law and prophets. If you're a Christian, you believe that all those prophecies are fulfilled. I would argue, along with Lewis and Tolkien and Milton and Chesterton and, and Augustine and Aquinas, so many people, that not only does Christ fulfill all the Old Testament law and prophets, he also fulfills the highest yearnings of the pagan people. Does that make sense? That's what finally brought Lewis to faith. He understood, yes. He is the, and my son uh, is, is in college, and he wrote uh, like this testimony, uh, kind of an intellectual testimony. And I didn't realize it. He talked about, you know, how I taught him, and he talked about how he actually accepted Christianity as a myth before he accepted it as a reality. Wasn't that beautiful? I didn't realize. And then he can understand. Then as he grew, realized. But at first, it was the story that attracted him. Right. Well, I want to tell you something really cool. My newest book is a children's novel. I, I don't have any copies with me, but it's, it's on Amazon. It's called The Dreaming Stone. And in this novel, my kids become part of Greek mythology. The first line of my book is, Daddy was in a coma. I put myself in a coma because Daddy represents the Western tradition, and the Western tradition is asleep. We've lost, okay? And the kids go to Greece to get away. You know, I'm in the, I'm in the hospital. They go away, and through magic, I'm part of Greek mythology. And it, it, it's like the Narnia books. It's an adventure story. Your kids will all the way, and it's great for school. Learn all about mythology. Uh, but it's got a Christian underpinning. Before I went into the coma, I had told my kids what I told them. Kids, 
you know, if you're my kids, when you grow up, I'm telling you Greek mythology stories one day, I'm telling you Bible stories the other day. And one time the kids asked, well, what's the difference between the Bible and these stories? And this is what I told them. The, the Greek mythology is like a candle. The Bible is like the sun. And in the novel, my son feels, they're only like it feels like the only way you can understand daddy is to understand what that means. And as they become part of, what I mean that, they, be, they, they join Orpheus to get Eurydice. They fly with Daedalus and Icarus. They fly in the uh, chariot of the sun with Phaethon. They, they, uh, 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 they help Demeter look for her, her daughter Persephone. They're part of, and it ends with them seeing Paul at the Areopagus. Uh, and they learn, again, that Christ is the myth made fact. Well, let me end with one thing. I want some time for questions. Let me end. Okay, what I've said so far, many, many people would agree with all the stuff I said about Paul at the Areopagus. But I want to give you something that I believe, I can't prove it to you, but I'm going to make the argument. I believe that there is a place in the Gospels where Jesus himself does what I'm advocating here, where he does what Paul does on the Areopagus. And it happens in, in John chapter 12. That's the last chapter before the Upper Room Discourse. And it is where Jesus has his last public lecture. And if you remember, it's the Passover. And there are a bunch of Greeks there who are sort of studying the Passover and the ceremony. And they go to Philip, one of the disciples who has a Greek name, and they say to him, we want to see Jesus. And they go to Jesus and say, there's some Greeks here to see you. Okay? They want to know if you'll endorse my big fat Greek wedding part two. It's pretty funny. Anyway, there are some Greeks here to see you. Now, Jesus doesn't go to them, but the Bible says, and then Jesus answered, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And then he says these words, except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it will remain a single seed. But if it dies, it will bear much fruit. In the King James, if a corn of wheat, look for it there, you'll see. Um, okay, now, I, I challenge you to scour the Old Testament. You will not find that metaphor anywhere. This idea of the seed that dies and is reborn is not a Jewish metaphor. He does talk about the sower and the seed, but that's a very different metaphor. The idea of the, of the seed that dies and sprouts and is reborn is not a Jewish metaphor metaphor, but it is a great metaphor. Now, the reason why I can't prove this is that the Bible does not tell us specifically who these Greeks are, but they are there because they're interested in the Jewish ceremony. I believe that they were members of the oldest cult of the ancient world, I mean religious cult, and it was called the Eleusinian Mysteries. It was a very ancient, it's, it's, it, people talk about it all the time, it, although we don't know a lot about it because they had secret, they were like the Masons, these secret rituals, right? And, but we know enough about them that we know that they worshipped Bacchus, the god of wine, that dies and rises, and they worshipped the story of Demeter and Persephone. And we know that on their altar, they put a ripe ear of wheat or corn on there. They, they worshipped the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. Okay, now... If, if they are coming from the Eleusinian Mysteries, and I think there's a good reason to believe that, then Jesus has just spoken directly to them. Why else does he say? Now, there is another place in the Bible where we get that metaphor again. It's 1 Corinthians 15, the great resurrection chapter, when Paul is talking about the resurrection body and about the seed. But Corinthians is written to the church at Corinth, okay? It's written to a Greek church as well. But if I'm right, then Jesus is speaking their language and saying, all these years you have worshipped the seed that dies and is reborn. Look, I am that seed. It is about to happen literally in time and space under Pontius Pilate in real space and time. And he is building a bridge to them. We need to do that. Anybody here a fan of a book called How the Irish Saved Civilization? Thomas Gale, one of my favorite books. Uh, I really do think that that guy might be a Christian. Uh, and, and he always talks about sex, but I think he does that to deflect the fact that he actually treats Christianity with respect. Probably more liberal theologically, but I mean, in all of his books, he treats Christianity fairly, with a fair amount of respect. But in How the Irish Saved Civilization, he shows that a lot of the pagan classics were preserved by Irish monks. Like the last people you think that would be preserved, but they preserved them through the Dark Ages. I want to argue that 
through the coming dark age, and there's a coming dark age that's coming in terms of knowledge, it is going to be the least likely people in the world who are going to save the classics. Super conservative Christian homeschoolers. <laughs> Now, folks, you need to understand, I love homeschoolers. My, my son's about to marry a girl that's homeschool. But you need to understand that if you go back about 25 years, how many homeschoolers did you know that were Bible-only people? Okay, this is a very recent thing. Suddenly, it is the conservative people like HBU, people like, we're saving. Well, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, the so-called Ivy League schools, while they're throwing out the canon left and right, we are preserving the pagan classics through the coming dark ages. Okay. It's, it's late. Let, let, let me end with a challenge. You're going to think I'm making this up, and I'm not making this up. Every so often something happens that opens up our eyes, and we suddenly understand the world view that we're living in. Several years ago, six, seven years ago, uh, my parents live in Florida, and I was in Florida, and there was a radio guy there, a very, very strong Christian believer, older man, good evangelist, but he was telling people on the air, don't read C.S. Lewis. He's bad. So somebody asked me to go talk to him. So I went and talked to him, and... As I expected, he hadn't read any C.S. Lewis. He read something on the internet, right? Okay, but what I didn't expect was this. I said, I said, sir, I said, what, you know, what C.S. Lewis have you read? For instance, have you read the Chronicles of Narnia? And this is what he said. This was a strong Christian man, a good evangelist. He said to me, ever since I became a Christian 40 years ago, I have not read a single work of fiction. Now, when he said that, he means he didn't read, and he didn't even read the Left Behind series, which is probably a good thing. Uh, but he didn't read anything. Now, why do I make that point? I didn't say much because he was a much older man. I wasn't going to be disrespectful. But if I wanted to be more belligerent, I would have said, you do understand that the parable of Jesus are short stories that he made up, right? Those are short stories. But anyway, that wasn't the point. The point here is, if you were to ask that man, why don't you read fiction? He would answer you, because I'm a Christian. But I argue that the real reason he doesn't read fiction is because he is a modernist and he doesn't know it. He has, even though he's a very strong Christian, has imbibed this enlightenment notion that this is fact and this is fiction, reason, emotion, reason, revelation, logic, intuition, history, myth, religion, or science, religion, and there's no meaning in between. We have bought it, when I say we are particularly thinking Baptists and, and, and more conservative evangelicals, we've bought into this idea that something's not true unless it's rationally, technologically, scientifically true. Now, we're fighting that. We're fighting the evolutionists, but without realizing it, we've accepted their worldview that says it's not true if it's not scientific. You understand what I'm getting at here? We have to be careful. I, I, we don't realize. I, here's another. Here, let, let, let's do a worldview game here, okay? Why did, Jesus, why, did, why did God forbid the Jews from eating pork and shellfish? If you're a typical American, your first reaction is, well, we now know that pork and shellfish carry a lot of diseases, and that's why God did it. Now, that may be the reason God did it, but the Bible says nothing about that, right? But you see, health to us is so important, and we're so into reason that we believe if God's... Not, look, Kentucky boy, if you're going to tell a Kentucky boy you can't have any pork... Right? You better have a darn good, logical, scientific health reason. Otherwise, I'm having my bacon in every single thing I eat. I learned that about Southern cooking. Bacon is, is the prime ingredient of everything. Okay? One of my, one of my, 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 uh, uh, one of my colleagues uh, uh, was reading his poetry, and he just suddenly stopped and said, I love pigs. And he went, he was a Southern, he went on and on about how he loves every part of the pig. And he listened. So, so again, you know, maybe it was a healthy, but again, the Bible, the Bible says it's got something to do with holiness, which is really hard to understand. But what I'm, what I'm trying to get us to think is, oh my gosh, without realizing it, we privilege health so much that we think that that's like the reason for everything. You understand what I'm getting at? Okay? It's the same thing, that a lot of times there's a resistance to like classical Christian education that we think is biblical, but it's really because we're a modernist and don't realize it, okay? I know a lot of Baptists who go crazy when somebody raises their hand and they say they're against it because it's non-biblical, but they're really against it because they're afraid of getting cooties, okay? You know what we, we very rarely say why we're, you know, we, we, we want to hide, we, we think there's a biblical reason, but it's not, okay? It is because we have allowed the modernist world to convince us that again, 
science, reason, logic are the only truth, and fiction will... I'll never forget, my mother-in-law once, I was teaching the kids about Dante or something, and I say that, you know, the griffin... What's a griffin? You know what a griffin is? Half? Uh, half lion, half... Eagle. eagle, very good. Half lion, half eagle, okay? I didn't see the mother whisper that, okay. Is that mom? Oh, you don't know, you're, no, your sister. You're, you're not old enough to be mom, okay? Anyway, the... Um, the, uh, and I was explaining to him, you know, why, that the, the lion part is the, the human part of Jesus, the lion of Judah, and the eagle is, is the divine part, because they used to believe that the eagle has such perfect vision, it can look into the sun and not go blind. I don't know if you know that, right? And after I said that, my mother-in-law spent the next time, no, no, now your kids know that's not true. That's not true. You understand that. She went, this was the woman, right? It wasn't my father-in-law. It was my mother-in-law. On and on. And it's like, calm down, Okay. Okay, but again, we, 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 we've just bought into this idea that everything... But I mean, like, for instance, I don't know if you know this, but in the, in the Baptist church, the thing that was dividing liberal and conservative Baptists 50 years ago was the virgin birth. Right? They had no problem with all the other miracles, but the, like, like God can't violate sex or something. I mean, you probably remember this, Martin. I mean, this is huge. In fact, it's so huge that the statement of faith that everybody signs at my school, it's a non-denominational statement of faith, actually says we believe in the virgin birth, but nowhere mentions the incarnation. Now, of course, we believe in the incarnation. But you understand? Now, you should understand, by the way, that there is a religion in the world that believes in the virgin birth, but completely rejects the incarnation. You know what it's called? It's called Islam again. Did you know Muslims believe that Mary was a virgin? Did you know that? It's in the Quran. They believe Mary was a virgin, but they completely uh, reject the incarnation. Okay? So again, we need to be careful, right? We need to be open because God does speak through our reason, but he also speaks through our imagination, through our sense of wonder and awe and beauty. Let me close in prayer. Father God, I thank you so much for this school, Father, and for its vision and for its desire to bring together Athens and Jerusalem that we might feed on all four truth and that we might take them up and use them to glorify you. Father... I pray for the parents here who are obviously making sacrifices to send their kids to a private school. Father, I pray that you would bless them and their family and that they would see the difference in their children, that they would see the difference in themselves, uh, and how they're helping to raise kids that are going to hold this country together. Father, I pray for the teachers here that you would give them perseverance and there are times when you just want to throw up your hands and give up, but Lord, of the importance of what is going on here. The equipping of hearts and souls and minds that will lead the people that we pray turn our country back into the right track. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow, that was fun. Thank you all. Oh my gosh. I hope it didn't go too long. Not too bad. There you go. Wow. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Go out and get the Dreaming Stone. It's only part one. Next year, the sequel's coming out in the Shadow of Troy, where the kids become part of the Iliad and the Odyssey. And part three is called The Gates of Freedom. They become part of the birth of Athenian democracy, and they help Leonidas and the 300 Spartans fight the Persians, while my daughter is taken over to Persia to help Esther. Because the bad guy, Xerxes, is the same person in both, uh, both books. Um, so, kind of, kind of fun. Do we have time for questions? Martin, do we have time? Or no? Yes. Oh, 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 I see what you Yeah. Any questions, thoughts? And I'll hang out afterwards. Go ahead. Pork and shellfish. Yeah, shellfish. Oh, yeah, shellfish is the other one. Yeah, you, you don't want to... Not the health reasons, but you never actually said what you thought. Oh, one, I think... That, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's got something to do with holiness. Right? I mean, and it's kind of weird. Remember all that stuff about chewing the cud and all that stuff? It's weird, but it seems that, I mean, like I said, it certainly is a method of separating them from the unbeliever. I mean, I don't know, but even, even modern Jews that are, that are Orthodox, you know, you're not allowed to have dairy and meat in the same meal. So you have to have like all different dishes. I mean, that's what I mean. You, if you're an Orthodox Jew, you can't go to your Gentile friend and have dinner because you know, we don't have separate dishes, unless you do, I don't know, uh, for these sorts of things. So if you talk to Orthodox Jews and you say cheeseburger, they'll just get sick to even think about it. Uh, but that's why you can be thankful if you're lactose intolerant like I am because they, those were the Jews that invented non-dairy ice cream, which sounds like an oxymoron, but it's actually pretty good stuff, you know, anyway. But the, uh, I don't know, when, you know, shellfish, again, you know, they're bottom dwellers, but... It does seem to have something to do maybe with scavengers, but, you know, it doesn't really say.
But it's got to do with, with being holy and set, well, circumcision, for that matter. Right? By the way, there are a lot of people today that think circumcision is child abuse, that are like fighting against that. I don't know if you know that. Seriously. Uh, and, and, uh, but again, it, it, it's a way of separating them. And, and God does away with those unless I, I speak for the Seventh-day Adventists. They, they still follow. There's a few Christians, but the vast majority of Christians, we don't follow those kosher laws anymore. I mean, God seems to make it pretty clear when he puts the tent down there for, for Peter and stuff like that. Even Jesus says it, right? He declared all foods clean. Uh, but again, it, do, it doesn't always, it doesn't give us the kinds of logical answers we want, right? It's a matter of trusting in God's overall vision and what he's doing to protect this people. I mean, I don't know. You know, there's that other thing about if you get mold in your house, it tells you how to clean it. I mean, that sounds kind of scientific too, but I don't know. Very, very strange. You know, sometimes, like, like why leprosy? It seems that, you know, why leprosy as opposed to any other disease in the world? Well, leprosy sort of does to your skin what sin does to your soul. So it does seem to be partly an external representation of what sin does to the soul. Right? So there, there seems to be a link there. I mean, God does weird things. All these people, I want to be a prophet. Remember what he did to Ezekiel? He made him lie on his, on his side for like a year. God does really weird things, okay? From our point of view. I mean, I'm sure they're not weird to his point of view. I'm sure he looks down here and sees things like Bix or something. He thinks that's, I don't know. I'm sure God you know, laughs a lot. You know, it's like, oh my gosh. What did Chester didn't say God's, what, what did Chester didn't say God obscured from us? The last line of Orthodox, do you remember? It was too much for us to bear. So what's the one thing Jesus didn't show us? Remember the last line of orthodoxy? His mirth. Somebody remembers. Very good. It was his mirth. Okay, that's the last line. Uh, we do it. In other words, the Bible says Jesus wept, but nowhere does it say Jesus laughed. If you want to get a little insight, read the, the really awesome book called Name of the Rose. That's all about that. Weird book. Um, but so we, we don't know. But I think it's got to do with keeping them separate from the people around them. That, they, that they've got to follow a law. And they've got to follow a code do it in a specific way, and it's a way of reminding them of it. And of course, you know, the, the Muslims still follow that no pork rule. And I told you, most Muslims are Asian, and Asians love pork even more than Southerners do. Uh, it's amazing that they don't eat pork uh, in, in these Asian countries that are Muslim, so it's kind of strange, but uh, I don't know. I'll eat pork chops. I'm not too crazy about the, the heavy red meat. That's kind of tough on me. Do any of your books deal with the redeeming of culture? To what extent? A little bit. I mean, I've got a book called Restoring, Redeeming of Culture. I mean, I talk about that in, in Restoring Beauty, True and the Beautiful, and the writing of C.S. Lewis, and that we, we need to, again, uh, I don't know if you know this phrase, but, but, okay, Lewis, I told you, was an atheist for a long time. One of the first beginnings of his move towards Christ, happened when he was about 16, was when randomly he picked up a, picked up a book by George MacDonald called Fantasties. And he read this book, and it's a Wild book, uh, you know, with a, a place with trees that are alive. It's, it's a crazy fairy world. But Lewis said when he read it, it baptized his imagination. The rest of it, he said, naturally took a little bit longer. But we, we need to, like, oh, I thought this was beautiful. Right? I told you, in a Baptist church, uh, don't, don't you love now? Have you ever seen praise dancing? Right? Of course, when people do that signing thing, it, that really is dancing in disguise, what it is. I don't know if you noticed that. It's the way you sneak dancing into the Baptist church. But anyway, you know, and it's really funny. I, I really wonder what the deaf people think when you're doing this. They probably think you're crazy. No deaf, you know, like, like whenever you see a non-deaf person sign, it's like five times bigger than a deaf person. But it, it looks pretty, right? Um, and, and all women know sign language, by the way. I don't know if you know that. But anyway, and... Uh, Sometimes, like, like, I come home and my wife is on the phone, and I say, who's on the phone? And instead of just say, speaking, she goes like this. And I say, I am not one of your female friends. I don't know what that means. Speak, you know, it's really strange. Sometimes I'm in my office, and here's the secretary, and one of her friends comes over, and there's glass in between them, and they speak to each other like this, and you know what they're saying. And then they go off. I don't know, it's strange. Look at it. Anyway, I don't know how I got off on that. Sign language, deaf, dancing. Okay, we need, we need to redeem these things, right? Take dancing back, okay? Read, read the Old Testament. I mean, the Psalms are always dancing to the Lord. I mean, uh, and remember, the one bad guy in the Old, the New Test the Old Testament is the one who despised somebody when he danced. Who was that? Yeah, that was Michael, right? The wife of David, okay? Who, who was barren after that, right? Um, we need, I, don't know if, I don't know if you know this story. Here, here's a good sort of story for what you're asking about redeeming culture. You all know who uh, General Booth is, founder of the Salvation Army? There's a famous story that one day he was um, up, 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 up in the second floor, and underneath was one of his brass bands, you know, the, the, the brass bands, and they're playing a beautiful hymn. 
And he listens and he says, you know, I recognize those words. He's saying to the, you know, his mates or whatever they call him. He says, I recognize these words, but where's that beautiful tune from? It's really lovely. And the guy got kind of red and he said, well, it's actually called Champagne Charlie is my name. It's actually a drinking song. Right? And apparently General Booth said, darn it, why should the devil have all the best tunes? And then from then on, he went on and took to it. You know that the Star Spangled Banner was a drinking song. You got to get awful drunk to be able to sing that thing. But anyway, uh, <laughs> the Star Spangled Banner was a drinking song uh, and, and a bar song. And, and what I'm saying is we need to reclaim or rehabilitate these things. We, we need, like for instance, look, we, we are the ones who, we Christians are the ones who really gave science fiction and fantasy. And now we've lost it. Almost all, you know, all the major science fiction writers now are all, not just non-believers, they're, they're atheists, okay? Josh Whedon is an atheist, okay? Uh, I'm trying to remember all, all their names. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Gene Roddenberry, who started Star Trek, is an atheist, okay? Uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, Neil Gaiman is an atheist. Uh, J. Michael Straczynski. These are all the people, uh, all the ones that are writing those, those, those graphic novels, like uh, the Batman one and the three, they're almost all atheists, right? And, and, and in some ways, they're better than the liberal Christians because they're, they're such atheists they, that they don't have an axe to grind. They just don't believe. And so they sometimes actually have Christian characters in their movies. Um, but it's time for us to take these things back. Take back movies. Take back TV. We're pretty good at radio. Okay, but we need to take... That's how we redeem the culture. Be salt and light. Good. By taking back, is that transformation part? Yes, it's, tra it's transforming. In other words, don't, don't just take it and Christianize it. Get back down to the roots, right? Every one of these people that writes now, uh, you know, was influenced by Lewis and Tolkien. And, and you know, before that, Dante, you know, uh, and, and, and before that, Spencer, Fairy Queen. Spencer was very much a believer. Um, and and uh, we need to, yeah, in other words, not just copy it, but try to get back down to the core of what attracts people to fantasy. I believe, here I am, an American Baptist, you know, and yet, why do people love Narnia and Middle Earth? I think that we are attracted to the medieval hierarchy that we see in those things. Even though we may be Americans and we're all about voting and we don't want a king and stuff, I think that we, do you, do you all have a Renaissance festival close to you? A Renaissance festival, do they have one? Yeah, if you ever go, beautiful place to go to, right? I love, we have, a, we have one of the best ones in the, in the country, in Houston, uh, about an hour from me. But whenever I go there and, I'm, and I look around at the other people, and it's really weird. Because these other people with me, I would disagree with them on every possible religious, theological, sociological, everything. They're just really freaky people. But they're here, okay? They're here. They're, you remember the old days when, when the, you know, the, the guys on their motorcycles, they would read The Lord of the Rings once a year? That's the only book they read, but they would read it once a year. I mean, because I think that there is a yearning for real story, for the beauty of hierarchy, Right? I do think, even though we're in a, a really, you know, sort of secular feminist age, we want to see masculinity and femininity again. I think people are getting tired of all this nonsense, okay? They want to see it, but it's really hard to do, okay? But they want to see it and come to Kentucky and meet the Kentucky girls, right? Yeah, there we go. Yeah. So, and, and, uh, but that's how we do it. And we do it by just doing it the best. It doesn't always have to be specifically Christian, but let's go in there and revive the way it's done. Bring story back down, you know? And it, it's really funny because if you saw episode three of Star Wars, uh, there, there's a scene where, uh, where the guy says uh, that, that, the, that, the, that, that the bad guys, the, the, the dark side, they have a tendency for, what's the, how does he put it? They have a tendency for extreme, what's that? Absolutes. Yeah, for absolutes. Yeah, they have a, and this is George Lucas trying to be liberal and being, you know, and, and saying, but then if you really listen to the movie carefully, it, 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 his own story goes against him because later on we find out that it is the dark side that doesn't believe in good and evil. Everything is pe permeable. And so it, he can't even do it. He tries to do it. He has the bad guy say, if you're not for me, you're against me, making fun of Bush, said something like that during the Gulf War. Uh, and and uh, he can't do it because the real nature of fantasy and story because we have what they call the meta-narrative. The meta-narrative is the greater narrative, the great story of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. And every story comes out of that story. Right? So in a sense, if we're just true to the true nature of story, we're going to write stuff that is Christian. You know, and everybody, they fight against it, but it doesn't work. You keep coming back. 
Heroism keeps coming back. Beauty keeps coming back. Self-sacrifice keeps coming back. Even when they try to do stuff that's horrible and ugly and nasty. It just keeps coming back. It's, it's an amazing thing. You can't get around it. So we, we, we just need, as Christians, to get our confidence back. Put it that way, okay? We need to get our confidence back, and, and you know, the whole world belongs to the Lord. And we need to reclaim. Lewis loved the word rehabilitate. Did you have a question? Yeah, um, I'm back on your neighbor. I've read Richard Neighbor and Richard Neighbor, and I was thinking about the choice of the over right. is what fascinates me. So there's Christ within culture, Christ against culture, etc. So I guess this promise I'll say, you're, I'm someone who was raised in my Protestant, uh -huh. is a student. I, I, I delight in studying different denominations and how they express Christianity. Okay. So, raised in my Protestant, I actually lived with the Amish for a while. And oh, wow. I had a face that was evangelical and I have now found my home in the Catholic Church. Oh, wow. So, my question is. Um, we have to choose one of the wars. That's a good point. I mean, like, so yeah. Catholic, we have this thing called religious community. That's true. Yeah, that's true. We tend to be more Christ against culture. Some of what you talked about. Now we're moving from maybe more the Anabaptists. That is true. You're you actually, that's a good point, the Anabaptists, yeah. So we allow within the Catholic Church and other, other faith traditions that there are more than one way of being do this thing. Let, let me give you. A, so I'm yeah. Why do we have to choose Christ over? Culture? I think. I myself yeah. Prefer Christ within culture. And, well, there's Christ you know, transforming Christ culture. culture. Yeah. That's my question. Is we have to choose one. I, I think. Yeah. I don't think we have to. I mean, I'm, I'm doing Christ over culture because I think it's a vision for a school like this. Let me give you an analogy for what you're saying because this is something that just struck me. Okay. Even though, you know, I'm a fellow traveler with the Catholics and Orthodox, like the, the, the typical evangelical Baptist, I love the Catholic Church, but it's like, you know, we feel like they maybe put a little overemphasis on celibacy and all that sort of stuff, and nuns and monks. So I'm pretty typical like that. But I remember something just struck me while I was reading and studying something, and something hit me that I think the medieval Catholic Church maybe understood something that we don't understand. You start really studying the lives of people like Teresa of Avila or, or uh, uh, what's, the, uh, what's her name? Uh, J J all, sh all will be well and all will be well. Uh, J Julian of Norris. Yeah, Julian of Norris. You start looking at those people. They're like Hildegard of Bingen and this stuff. And you look at their lives. I look at those people and I say, you know, if they live today, they might be considered sociopaths or bipolar. Now, what am I getting? I'm not making fun of them. Let, 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 let me get carefully here. The trouble in the evangelical church is that we do a great job sharing the gospel and stuff, but if you are not the bright, smiley, shining person, there's not really a place for you in the church. You understand what I'm getting at? If you're a single person and you really don't get along with other people, we don't really have a role for you. And one of the things that struck me is whether they meant to do it or not, I think the Catholic Church was wise enough to say that here is a person that in the evangelical world would be left out. There would be no place. He'd be the crotchety old guy. But here, we put him in a monastery, and he becomes a saint. You understand? I believe that. Let me finish this, because it's going to sound at first like one of these terrible uh, evangelical attacks on, on, on Catholicism. That there may have been a lot of monks in the early church, in the, in the medieval church, that were struggling with a gay orientation. Now, I'm not saying that they're all gay in disguise, because that, that was a, what I'm saying is that maybe these are people that realized that they were not made for marriage, and so they've taken a vow of celibacy, and they are living in community. I'm not saying all the monks are gay. <laughs> what I'm saying is that even though to me as a typical American, you know, I think, well, you know, husband, wife, kids, that sort of stuff, that's really not for everybody. People have their different gifts, their different charisms. And I think kind of what you're getting at is I think there are a lot of people who would not thrive in a regular church setting who would be a great person for God in a monastery. You know, Thomas Merton, if he hadn't been in the monastery, he probably would have become a heretic, okay? But by being in the monastery and following its rules, and sometimes he does push the envelope, uh, but by being in the monastery under obedience... I think he was able to actually serve the church, whereas if he left the church and was only a college professor, he might have become Bart Ehrman or something like that. You understand what I'm getting at here? Is this making sense? 
Again, it's, it's something that, that's, again, that, that's really very foreign to me. Why are you doing it? Again, I'm enough of American to say, why are you sitting out there, living out there? Why don't you change the world? Right? That, that's a very American, pragmatic way. And even I can't overcome that. It's still in the back of my head. But when I stop and look at myself and say, well, wait a minute, right? The real medieval understanding was that the monks and nuns were praying for society. And that was an active role that they were playing. And these are people that might not have functioned in a regular church, right? But here, you know, we all have different personalities, right? Some people are called to a single life. There are some people that probably never should have gotten married, maybe should never have had kids, okay? But you have no choice. There's also a lot of kids that shouldn't go to college when they're 18. But do we give them a choice? No, <laughs> okay? I probably would have upset if my kids said no too. I mean, we have one way of doing things. So that's a long way around of saying, yes, I think there is a place for Christ against culture. There are some people that need to be in that community and will thrive in that community. I just, here's a radical example of that. Uh, I've known a few people that, that were in prison and when they were in prison and part of prison ministries, they were really strong, but when they got out of prison, they fell apart. They just need, maybe they needed to be in a monastery, or maybe the military, whatever. But these are people who in the right setting can be really, really strong for God. But when that's taken away, they fall apart. So I think there is a place for that. What a word, a word of faith community, isn't there one? The Catholic Church, is it called Word of Faith or Word of God? Or something, one of my friends was part of that. Um, but again, I, I, it's not my way, I and mean, we, we know that lead to a kind of legalism is probably the biggest danger of that. But again, there, there's a place, you know, God calls people, I mean, just think of how different the disciples are, right? What different personalities they have and what different callings people have. And remember that hospitality is a calling and mercy is a calling, right? Gifts of administration, God forbid, that's a, that's a spiritual gift. Did you know that? Administration. <laughs> Good. Um, I think you kind of already answered this, but you talked about finding the highest of ancient Greek uh -huh. Roman culture. Um, can we or how do we find the highest of our own American ah. culture? And I'm thinking literature particularly. And if you've already answered that, you have some examples. Yeah, let me think. I mean, I mean, one of the funny things is that some of the most Christian movies I see were made by Steven Spielberg, who was Jewish, okay? See Amistad, okay? There's, have you seen Amistad? There's a scene in Amistad that's one of the most amazing things. Oh, there you go. And one of the most amazing things I've seen, it's, Amistad is about a, a group of slaves that, that, that they're, they're, they escape from their ship, right? And then they're caught later, and then they're put on trial and stuff. It's a true story. But... The, 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 the African slave from Africa are in the prison and the, um, the abolitionists, the Christian abolitionists are coming to share the gospel with them. And one of them has given one of the Africans a Bible with pictures and through it, he has become a believer. And there is this unbelievable scene, I wish we would see it in Christian movies, where he calls the main guy, the hero over, and he's showing him what he's learned. And he's going through the, and he's showing the pictures of the Jews. These people are just like us in chains in Egypt, right? And then they escaped, right? And he's showing them. And he says, and then everything changed when this person came. And what's brilliant is he's, he's understood the gospel just from the pictures. But while he's telling the other guy the story, the other guy's look at him like this and kind of laughing at him. And it's, it's better be, by putting that in there, we understand that we are sometimes fools for God and that we seem foolish in the eyes of the world. And what they're able to do is have both in there. So we see the, the passion of the world to become a believer, but we also understand that the world often laughs at that. So a lot of times I see, I see and like I said, it, it, it's weird, but you know, we have to look to the superhero movies because there's a desire for heroism again. Right? Heroism would be beautiful again. We need courage to come back. It's really a shame because I'm convinced that uh, J.K. Rowling, who wrote the, 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 the uh, is a believer, probably of a more liberal, but she seems to be a church-going believer person. And you know, those, those books are, are steeped in traditional virtues. Right? Uh, and in fact, if you've seen, is it the second movie? The second movie that has the basilisk in it, that was the second movie, right? Uh, it's pretty amazing because 
She works out a medieval allegory for Christ. Because the basilisk, when it looks at you, you turn to stone, like the Medusa, is, you know, it was always a representation of Satan in medieval allegory. And it's going after the boy, and who comes to the rescue? The phoenix. The phoenix that dies and is reborn out of its ashes, which is a type of Christ, just as the griffin is. And it's, or anyway, and the, the, it comes and it blinds the basilisk. And saves, I mean, this, this is a working out of Christian ideas. Now, there is only one thing in Harry Potter that somebody made an argument to me that is bad, and this might be true. It does seem that in every single movie, every single book and movie, the kids always do misbehave, and they always get applauded for it later. That maybe is a little problematic for teachers, okay? Uh, but that's also plot structure. It's hard to get around that. So I thought, yeah, maybe there's a problem. But generally speaking, we're working within a framework that privileges courage, right? Real courage, real beauty, real truth, real good and evil. I mean, let me give you a good example of this. I actually let my kids see uh, The Lord of the Rings when they were very young, like seven. Maybe that was too young. But even though it's violent, I allowed my kids to see it because from my point of view, it was violence for a purpose. It was about good. I even let them see Braveheart rather young too because the violence had a purpose. It was about courage. It was about self-sacrifice. On the other hand, I would not let, I, don't, I wouldn't even watch it with them now, but I wouldn't let my children see a serial killer movie even if it was edited for television. Understand? I, I don't want their minds corrupt. I don't understand this fascination in modern America with serial killers. How many, not every, every single crime show has at least two or three episodes a year about serial killers. Why we're fascinated with the, see, I wouldn't let them see that because that senseless evil violence. But violence, if it really is about good and evil and the sacrifice we have to make, I was okay with that in things. And, and I, and I want to see that uh, redeemed. Right? I, I want them to be open to the fact that we live in a dangerous world. Here's something that Lewis says that, that might help you. Um, okay, Lewis loved fantasy, but he always hated what are called school stories. And what school stories are is where you start with the kid and he's sort of picked on and then he wins out and becomes the head of the team or the head cheerleader or whatever and gets over on all those kids. Lewis said, I think those books are much more damaging than fantasy books because the school stories basically breed pride and arrogance. In you. Yeah, I bet, you know, and, and, and no, but whereas a real fantasy story, it's humility. You come into a world of fantasy and you're in awe and it overwhelms you. And he said, no, fantasy does not hurt them. If anything, it teaches a proper sense of wonder. Lewis liked to call it the numinous, that, that sense of, oh, like when you get goose flesh, Mufasa, ooh, that kind of stuff, right? Uh, that, that's what he, he said, that, that's good for kids. That doesn't, it, it, that doesn't fill them with pride. It fills them with humility and a desire to be courageous. But we give the stuff that they give them to read. It's just, oh. I was so naive many years ago. Somebody told me, Oprah has a book club. And for some reason, I had this idea that Oprah was reading the Odyssey with everybody. Yeah, so much for that. I mean, again, every book was about some woman that's victimized. And this is supposed to strengthen women to read stories about victimization. Don't get it. I just don't get it. Um, but, the, uh, but, but, but again, there, there is stuff out there that can be... Look, if you have kids, the best thing they can watch is Thomas the Tank Engine. You watch Thomas the Tank Engine? I don't know if that's still good, at least when my kids were young. I mean, there are real moral stories that are being taught to the kids. When my kids were young, the narrator was Ringo Starr. So that whole generation of kids doesn't know Ringo because of the Beatles. They know him because, you know, he, he reads for that. It's hysterical, right? Even George Carlin, who is actually a very foul-mouthed comedian, is really wonderful when he reads for Thomas the Tank Engine. Uh, but um, th there are good things out there that teach them, you know, good lessons and that will entertain them as well. And we need to do that. I, I raised my kids, I was telling Martin, on the Red and Blue Fairy book. You know that by Andrew Lang? Those are the best tellings of the fairy tales. And there's a whole bunch of them from all over the world. Read those things to the kids, right? Uh, another book that they should read that is not read enough in America is Wind in the Willows. Do you read that at your school? Yeah. It's a, a, every British kid reads that, but most of them, I, I never heard of it when I was a kid. Uh, well, I did see Mr. Toad when I was a kid at Disney, but it's, I don't remember ever reading that as a kid. Uh, that's a wonderful book. It was a big influence on Lewis. Uh, I, I just started reading, finally, Edith Nesbitt. You know, Edith Nesbitt, she was a huge influence on Lewis. Uh, one of my students is doing an honors thesis with me uh, on Edith Nesbitt. A uh, big influence on that. And get them reading. The Brothers Grimm and, and Hans Christian Andersen and, and uh, Arabian Nights, slightly expurgated, please, on the Arabian Nights. Uh, but there's wonderful things to read. Your focus is on fiction. That's a 
Okay. What resonated with me as I heard you speaking is uh, I've been having some thoughts along these same lines about some aspects of our current culture okay. that I've found myself saying for other reasons, but they're not fiction. Okay. So, for example, one of them is something that, that maybe some people have heard of. It's David Allen's book, Getting Things Done, which is a oh, Okay. And I can't stop thinking about the core Christian wisdoms that comes to, in the process of constructing this productivity, that reminds me, I read a book many years ago that you might have read called, uh, what was it called? One second. The sequel was Good to Great. The original book was, oh my gosh, it's that coming, about being a clock builder. It's about being a clock maker. I can't believe it's that coming. But it's a business book about how you build successful companies by building them around a core of values. Now, the guy's secular, so your value might be uh, making everybody happy. But still, it's a Christian understanding that if you don't have a core of values at the center, it's going to fall apart. And again, we can read that. And you, you, you do know that the Covey guy is actually, is actually a Mormon, uh, Seven Habits for Highly Effective People. Uh, uh, now, it, it, will be, it will be published eventually, but I've got other books in the queue. But I have wrote, when my kids went off to school, advice to my son and advice to my daughter. And at some point, I'll get this published under advice to my children, for the two of them. But the reason I wrote that is because self, I'm not, not really big into self-help, but there's been a huge change. You need to understand how different the self-help books were 70 years ago. Everything changed with how to win friends and influence people. Before that book, if you read any kind of self-help, it was about instilling integrity, honesty, right? It was all about, ver today, it's about getting ahead, tr you know, tricking people, influencing people. No, no they, not that that's always evil, but that should not be our center, right? Yeah, it's, right, self centered so making a, building a network and all that sort of, but if you go back to earlier stuff, even, even if you read, you know, Benjamin Franklin was more of a deist than a Christian, but you know, his, his wisdom, his proverbial wisdom is very much like the book of Proverbs, right? And by the way, I happen to speak for a school in Fullerton, California that happened to be two-thirds Korean. So I spent a little time saying that if I was giving this speech in Asia, I would tell them that I think that Christians can learn a lot from Confucius and Buddha. And I'd have to be careful, partly because Buddhism is still a living religion. You know, Platonism is not a living religion. So, it, you know, so you have to be a little more careful with that. But there are a lot of social things that can be learned from Confucius and taken up into Christian, just as Christians have done with Plato and Aristotle and Cicero. Like I said, it is more tricky because Confucianism is also a living religion uh, in, in China. Uh, but still, I think that we can learn from those things. Muhammad's a little bit more difficult because Muhammad is after Christianity and he's taking the Bible and twisting it. It's a little more difficult, although still there are some basic th truths there because it's like the Bible rewritten anyway. Um, but we have to be a little careful with other things. But with things that are before Christ, Zoroaster, nobody reads Zoroaster anymore. We only have thus spoke of Zarathustra. Dum, dum, da, da. You know, but, um, but again, and, and, and you're right. I, I think we can read books in economics. You know, we can read books in business where we can gain this because it's about values, right? And you know, again, the people that rise to the top generally are actually fairly moral people. Okay, we, we, we get a few bad people. The worst ones are the middle managers. You ever work for a middle manager? Those are the, as they move up and up and up, right? Most of the top military people are not the crazy people we see in movies, right? By the way, every single centurion that we see in the Gospels and the Book of Acts are what kind of people? Extremely noble. The first centurion we meet, what does Jesus say to him? I have not seen faith like this among the people of Israel. There's another centurion who says, surely this man is the son of God. It might have been the same centurion or a different one. There is the centurion uh, who uh, is named Cornelius and becomes a believer. He was a God-fearing Gentile whom the Jews loved and wanted God to visit him. Right? There's another centurion <coughs> that helps Paul when he's on the, on, the, on the boat to Rome. And remember, there's a crash. And they could have all died, but the man trusted Paul enough that said, listen to him. I mean, every centurion we meet in the book of Acts and, 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 and the Gospels is noble. They rose up. So read these sorts of things. There's a lot of truth. There's even some truth in psychology. Who knows? Anyway, there was a good guy named M. Scott Peck. He's very good if you read him. Um, although he went off the deep end at the very end of his life. But uh, most of his books are very, very good. The People of the Lies, one of the best books you'll ever read about evil as narcissism. Uh, but then he 
couldn't understand the resurrection of the body at the end of his life. Are we out of time, or you have a question? Yeah, what do we? And then I'll, I'll hang. I'll, I'll stay here as long as you need. Yeah, we'll do a one-on-one -on -one Q and A. And uh, this is great stuff. And like I said, we have. And I will hang out here, and uh, I will see you all later. Thank you. Thank you. Great fun.